Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Emerging Markets Insight Series uh, on growth and globalization after the pandemic, uh, organized by the Institute for Emerging Market Studies here at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and uh, supported by our partners, uh, UI Hong Kong. Uh, today's session is on uh, what happens to growth and globalization in emerging markets after the pandemic. Uh, after decades of intensifying globalization, we have, see, we have seen clear signs of a deceleration uh, after the global financial crisis. Uh, COVID-19 has probably amplified this trend. Uh, it may also accelerate the decoupling of US uh, and China and create a stronger impetus for efforts at regionalization and localization. So in today's webinar, we will explore how these trends around deglobalization and decoupling affect emerging markets that have long depended on a global trade, stable US-China economic relations, and foreign direct investments to drive economic growth. How prolonged are the effects of COVID-19 on trade, technology exchange, and cross-border financial flows likely to be? How would China adopt, adapt its economic model in the post-COVID world? And how should econo uh, emerging markets respond in the global economic system that may be significantly transformed by COVID-19? These are some of the questions that we will explore in this webinar. To kick us off, uh, let me invite uh, the managing partner of EY Hong Kong, uh, Ms. Agnes Chan, to give us uh, her welcome remarks. Uh, Agnes, over to you. Thank you, Donald. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the Emerging Market Insight Series. Although we are unable to meet in person, it is great that we are still able to gather virtually to discuss this important topic facing us today. Now, as we begin 2021, Governments around the world are working hard to provide their populations with COVID-19 vaccines and more fully open up their economies. So given this, I believe the timing is right for us to look at some of the trends that will bring us beyond the pandemic. Our panelists will be talking about deglobalization, a trend that emerged well before the pandemic, but has shown signs of acceleration since. I'd like to comment quickly on three aspects of this. Well, first, a severe drop in global mobility. Much like Google in the field of search, Zoom is now a verb, which means hosting and attending online meetings. It is symbolic of the way companies have adapted to a remote and digital fast way of working. At EY to safeguard employee health, work from home has been a company norm throughout this pandemic. And for a company with over 300,000 team members globally, it has been a remarkable transition. But this is not just about introducing a more flexible work arrangement. COVID-19 has challenged us to reconsider how we go about with everything, from ensuring our teams have the right tools they need to carry out their work, to provide opportunities for them to stay connected in meaningful ways with their colleagues. One area that companies have to think about is their culture. How do you build an engaging company culture with a global team all working remotely? Well, the second point is about disruption to the global supply chain. When the, when the pandemic hit, global supply and logistic chains were disrupted and protectionism in trade intensified due to the shortage in PPE supplies. Travel restrictions imposed by various countries significantly reduced the flow of people, goods and capital. These effects led us to believe that the world may no longer be a global village. However, Brick and mortar retailers quickly discovered the importance of e-commerce and implemented online to offline operations. Although it was challenging for many companies at the start, it has changed the way how business is conducted. And in the long run, it will be for the better. E-commerce helps companies reach customers from around the world. And key to this progress has been technology, be it robotics, or cloud computing or AI. The adoption of technology has, that has happened during the pandemic will continue. Another important part of this process has been the establishment of multilateral corporations like RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which has strengthened the economic links between key trading countries in Asia Pacific in response to the changing global geopolitical landscape. And this brings me to my next and final point, deglobalization or not, the need for international collaboration never went away. 
So although the pandemic outbreak has resulted in travel restrictions and economic lockdowns, the need for international collaboration has remained. And this, this was seen last year with the production and distribution of PPE supplies, and this year in the rollout of the vaccines. The pandemic has also underscored the importance and endurance of global trade in driving economic recovery. A good example being the Chinese government's recent announcement that exports grew 60% in the first two months of this year compared to 2020. It is important for us to realize through the fight against COVID-19 that it is not about any one nation winning over the rest or isolating itself from all the others, but about countries finding new ways to work together for the well-being of the entire human race. I'd love to hear from our their views on growth and globalization or the globalization after the pandemic. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Hong Kong UST, IEMS and IPP for co-organizing this series and Professor Alicia uh, professor, uh, Dr. David Skilling, Professor Albert Park, and Professor Don Lo uh, for being with us today. And I look forward to, your, to their insights during the upcoming discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Agnes, for the reminder that globalization is by no, uh, deglobalization uh, may not be inevitable. And of course, reminding us also of the importance of uh, cross border collaboration. So in this uh, expert panel, uh, we have lined up three uh, speakers. Uh, the first is uh, Professor Alicia uh, Garcia Herrero, who's adjunct professor of economics at UST, as well as uh, the chief economist for Asia Pacific at Natasys. Uh, she'll speak about deglobalization in the context of US-China decoupling and the implications for key emerging markets. I'll then invite uh, Dr. David Skilling, the founding director of Landfall Strategy Group, uh, to talk about how emerging markets need to adapt their growth models and in particular look at the experience of Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, the two most globalized economies in the world, and see how they are adapting to this uh, post-COVID world. Finally, I'll call on uh, Professor Albert Park, who is Chair, Professor and Head of Economics at UST, to who explore how the Chinese economy is likely to adapt to post-COVID realities, how those responses might affect emerging markets, and what are the longer term impacts of China's dual circulation strategy? Uh, so without further ado, uh, I've, I've also asked the speakers to each speak for about 15 minutes. So we have plenty of time for questions uh, from the audience, as well as for exchange among the speakers. Uh, if you're attending uh, on Zoom, please feel free to send us your questions on, uh, on, on the Q&A box, and I'll collect them at the end uh, and ask uh, our expert panel uh, to give their uh, quick responses. Uh, so without further ado, let me hand the time over to Alicia to uh, give us her, her presentation. Over to you, Alicia. Thank you, Donald. I'd like to first thank, uh, of course, uh, our sponsor, EY, Agnes, for the kind introduction, Hong Kong UST, IMS. It's a great pleasure to be here. Your events are always, uh, you know, uh, spotted on. And I think this topic is particularly important in, at the current juncture. So I'm very, very pleased to contribute. Um, I'm going to use some slides based on a, a thought leadership piece published by IMS. So um, some publicity for, for our institution. Let me share with you first and see if you can see them properly. There you go. I hope it's fine. So I'm going to use the remaining minutes, hopefully quite aggressively. I have lots of graphs to show, but I still hope I can pass on the messages. Um, so the question really uh, is whether we are deglobalizing. And I think there's no firm answer because it depends on what you look at. There's so many aspects of globalization. I'm actually writing a piece now for Project Syndicate with a colleague of mine, uh, he's sitting in, in Abu Dhabi and he's very keen on, on re-globalization. So we're writing about the next phase of globalization, which is not really here, but I'm just starting with this positive note that maybe most of what I'm going to show you is actually on the de-globalization side. And um, 
I would say it's no globalization, so slow globalization rather than full deglobalization. But there are other aspects that I'm not covering. Hopefully, we, we, we can show that soon, which is about places like Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore, about digital services, and in particular, obvious digital services like accounting, like you know, all of those things that probably won't be deglobalized. But I'm just saying that's only for the very few. That's not for everybody. That's not for major economies. So what I'm going to focus here is not really necessarily about Hong Kong or Singapore. It's about the world. So bear with me, it might be negative, but it might not necessarily affect economies like Hong Kong or Singapore. So I want to leave that very clear. I do think it's important because it does affect the global economy. So I'm going to talk about trade, foreign investment, people to people global deglobalization de or globalization, technology and currency at the end. So lots to cover in a very few minutes. On trade, of course we've seen a, a very fast recovery of trade when we look at value, volume, this is gross trade. However, we have more important structural trends on value chains that actually clearly indicate that the size of global value chains has been shrinking since 2008. And that has nothing to do with COVID. My data go up to 2018. That's basically the input output data we have available. So we, we do have to think about the fact that this is not COVID. This is a general structural trend. And you may say, is this because of China? And now we hear a lot about, you know, reshuffling of value chain against from China, away from China. No, this is not about China. This is mostly Europe. Uh, the size or the basically the participation of Europe in the global value chain has been shrinking. That's the dotted, the dots here at, on the right hand side of the graph faster than even the US and China much less so. So there is the globalization of, or at least a uh, reduction of value chains everywhere, but most importantly in Europe. That's first thing. What may happen next in terms of China and how we perceive it, that's a different topic not covered here. We don't even have the data to really be very firm about this. FDI, same trend and well before uh, COVID. Actually for FDI, when thinking about deglobalization versus, versus decoupling, decoupling, focusing on China, US, interestingly, in 2020, we see a reversal. Inward FDI into China has been growing very fast. So, so I, I just have to make here this dif difference between structural trends and what may happen because of COVID. The structural trends uh, on world inward FDI or world outward FDI, you can imagine that these are very similar numbers, just that they don't really cross, but it's actually a re relatively downward trend as well. Now, if I focus on the decoupling story, I'm now more on financial flows. It's actually also true that US FDI into China has been coming down. And the same is true for Chinese FDI into the US. The exception, was 2020 as regards global FDI into China, as I mentioned. So, but the bilateral flows have been coming down. This is also true for financial flows. For example, US holdings of Chinese long-term securities, which has have been stagnant. Stagnant may look good, but actually when you think about the fact that foreign investors have actually rushed into Chinese uh, Chinese markets, both equity and fixed income, this number doesn't look very appealing because the rest have been increasing very rapidly. And the same is true for Chinese holdings of US treasuries, stagnant and actually coming down. So the point I'm trying to make here is that there's two things happening. Global trends in maybe I shouldn't say full deglobalization, but globalization in trade, in FDI, and also some push coming from the decoupling story, US-China strategic competition, which basically adds, adds to the complication. But these are two different issues. 
Uh, in fact, it is not necessarily always the case that we that decoupling really pushes the globalization. One important uh, thing that we always read about, I mean, we have the sanction story, we have uh, potential delistings from the US. I just want to make the point that actually the number of Chinese corporates listed in the US keeps on growing. So sometimes we get like wrong signals as to what is really happening. Uh, there's more on the uh, on the uh, FI, meaning fixed asset uh, part, and, and real economy, like uh, foreign direct investment, than actually on the equity side so far. People to people is not so much deglobalization here. Of course, COVID, I mean, if we include COVID, of course, it would be plummeting. But I, I would imagine that that's short term. We're not really worried about that becoming a long term story, although we never know. But I just want to show you that before COVID, we already had stagnant growth, still growth, stagnant growth in people to people movement. So for example, tourism arrivals globally. Of course, I mean, international uh, flight, uh, flight passengers stagnant, not growing before COVID. International migrant stock, basically the growth rate stabilizing. So there is some trend out there that for structural reasons, globalization was at, at least slowing down. Um, on technology, this is really a decoupling story. This is not a deglobalization story. So although there is a general trend for the US to tighten on its export licenses globally, as you can see from that graph, the year-to-year -year growth on the left is, of course, coming down to zero. But this is much faster for the for China. Um, beyond that, in the case of China, you even have actual uh, constraints. I mean, like like beyond the export licenses related to sanctions list, whether it's the Pentagon list, whether it's the China military firms, whether it is the export licenses that I just showed you. So it becomes basically beyond trade into the, into the financing of things, which is the Pentagon list and the China military firms, which of course Hong Kong knows a lot about. Thanks God, this is yet to be fully implemented. So we're waiting for final decision from the Biden administration, as you all know. I have to say that beyond the hardware, I mean, the export of technology, we also have, of course, decoupling in the software space. Yeah, we can think of many targeted companies. This is, of course, especially true for US, but it's going beyond. And we have India, we have Europe, uh, although, of course, the bilateral investment agreement signed between Europe and and China brings some light, potential light to this situation. But I, I do think that on the software space, it's, it's going to become increasingly plausible to think of bifurcation, which is a word, as you know, used by this very famous report on asymmetric competition by basically uh, the industry in the US, including of course, ex CEO of uh, Google on, on this idea that the one and only way out is um, he used to use the word of two ecosystems, but now really the concept is bifurcation. And I think it's a better concept because it means you have two poles and then bifurcate. So they create kind of parallel universe. And I think that's where we're heading on the software space. Currency to end, uh, I hope I'm on time. I'll be very brief. This is, of course, the key question mark, because this, this to me, rocks the boat. It's just a different uh, ball game, because currencies, as you know, have huge uh, network externalities. So if we get into something similar to what we've seen in tech for currencies, we would be literally in a different world. We would be in a world with massive capital account controls and, and maybe even beyond. So. So that would be extremely negative, in my opinion, for global growth. One aspect of it, of it is, of course, the weapon, weaponization of the dollar, whether that can create kind of more and more pressure to create alternative uh, currencies or use alternative currencies. And this, bring, I mean, this is related to the previous topic of using sanctions and 
and export controls to basically create this bifurcating world. Um, so basically the idea, this is the, the publication I mentioned before, asymmetric competition, which, which is this idea of bifurcating. I think, frankly speaking, I think it is in nobody's interest, neither the US or China to, to push, uh, to rock this boat, I to, 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 to suddenly at the worst of all times with the, pan, with the pandemic, with huge debt accumulated all over the world, suddenly kind of substituting the existing reserve currency for one for another. It's, put it this way, whenever this has to happen, it shouldn't be now. And I think that's an important consideration. Of course, um, I don't think, frankly speaking, that it's going to happen anytime soon. I, I still think that there is no market that is more liquid than the US treasuries. And we've seen the, you know, the steepening of the curve recently and how it's been controlled somehow it's not gone out of, um, you know, out of control. But, but there could be other instances. Of course, one creeping uh, reality is the, the, the digital currency space. And this is not about cryptos. I don't think that are of any risk to the dollar whatsoever, but rather uh, the remedy. And the reason, and, and the question really here is whether you can kind of carve out your space through the circulation overseas, obviously, of a digital currency beyond the, the and by the way, this list is already outdated because China has already signed uh, several MOUs, one with UAE, for example, to, to really use the digital renminbi uh, overseas, also with SWIFT, a joint venture to, to expand the use of renminbi. But the point is that in itself is not in competition because this is about payments. The real question is whether you actually use that to dump the dollar as a financial vehicle. That's where the risk starts. And I think that in itself is something that we all want to avoid in the current, in the current circumstances. And that this should be more of a, more of a, an economic reasoning to use the renminbi beyond borders slowly but steadily so as not to create such disruption. So in other words, <clears throat> out of everything I said, the idea is that, but well, you, you see it there, by the way, I mean, the use of the CNY for payments and payments is indeed, you know, this is SWIFT data, is still very, very small compared to major international currencies. Um, but the thing I, I wanted to say is that out of everything I've reviewed, there are clear trends of deglobalization in value chains that are not related to China that are a more general structural reason. And there's more research out there by the EU, European Commission on this, talking about the shortening of the value chain, making it shorter rather than, and that's why in, in the data, it looks like smaller, but it's just shorter. It's like more in, within the region. The other thing is uh, FDI, which is related because you know if your value chains are shrinking, you do not have so much investment to, to, to to accommodate them. People to people, I think this is, maybe we had gone too far. Maybe, you know, that was not the optimal level. I'm not saying this is negative in itself, but we need to realize that this is happening. In tech, I think it is negative and we see bifurcation being pushed, whether it's a hard or soft um, uh, in the software space. And in, in currency competition, I think we're very far from actual from really talking about bifurcation decoupling as is the case for tech and rightly so, because it would be just too dangerous for the global economy, especially now. So that's all from my side, thank you. Mm, thank you very much, uh, Alicia. Uh, I think it's very important as you rightly pointed out for us to be quite clear on you know, what the terms we mean. Uh, Deglobalization is bandied around and often it applies and we use it, we use it very loosely. And what I think the value of your presentation is to say that let's be quite specific about the domain. So maybe deglobalization in tech and global value chains. Uh, when it comes to FDI, it's more a story of slowbalization, a slower uh, expansion growth in uh, you know, FDI flows. Uh, when it comes to tech, there is the risk of uh, bifurcation, not quite there yet, but there's certainly the risk. And also thanks for reminding us that when it comes to currency competition, 
the risks of disruption to capital markets uh, as well as currency markets, uh, which are currently so integrated, might be quite underestimated. And this is something that certainly bears uh, closer watching. So with that as the context and, and, and the clarification in what uh, deglobalization means in, in different domains, uh, why don't I invite uh, David Skilling to, to speak specifically about impacts and implications for the growth models of uh, emerging markets. And of course, among across emerging markets, there's already a wide diversity of economic strategies and growth models. So what is all this deglobalization in its various forms uh, likely to mean for emerging markets? And what might the experiences of Hong Kong and Singapore uh, portend for, for, for emerging markets? Uh, over to you, David. Great, thank you very much, Donald. Let me just uh, share a few slides. My remarks are going to be uh, based on uh, a couple of documents, a couple of papers that I have prepared for the Institute uh, over the last uh, month or so. So for those interested, uh, the, the papers are there on the Institute's website. Uh, but the first half of what I'm gonna talk about is um, a sense of what does the uh, deglobalization and the impact of COVID have for growth models in emerging markets, particularly those in Asia. Uh, and what might the policy priorities be uh, in response? There's quite a few similar themes uh, to those that, that Alicia has just talked about. Uh, and then secondly, using as an example of some of those dynamics, uh, the examples of two city-states uh, in Asia, Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, and trying to get a sense of what those respective experiences might suggest about uh, the way in which uh, policymakers uh, might respond uh, to those dynamics. So I guess the first observation uh, to make, and again, building very directly on, uh, on Alicia's remarks, uh, is that you know, Asian emerging markets have uh, benefited uh, very much from a period of intense globalization over the last uh, several decades. This chart just shows uh, world exports of uh, goods and services as well as uh, direct investment flows. And you can see from the 1980s, 1990s, very sharp increase. It's flattened off uh, so-called globalization uh, over the last decade or so. Uh, but there's no sign, I don't think, or no indication that's going to go fundamentally uh, into reverse. Uh, but you know, Asian markets in particular have done uh, very, very well out of that process. Many have very high export shares. Their growth models are heavily leveraged uh, into, uh, into the global economy. You can see that through this chart, uh, just a selection of, of Asian economies from some of the ASEANs, uh, China, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, all at slightly different uh, time periods have a similar profile. Uh, of fairly strong increases in export intensity. Uh, and that has been, if you like, the productivity growth engine uh, of these economies as they've integrated into global supply chains, uh, growing their export sectors, uh, they've been able to develop very, very quickly. Uh, again, you see a, a profile of, of slowing, of flattening, and in some cases of a degree of unwinding uh, in the export shares. But I wouldn't want to exaggerate that again. I don't think there is a fundamental reversal of globalization, but what I think is there is a changing uh, in the shape uh, of that. Um, there is a, a reconfiguration of the uh, geography of supply chains. Uh, there's increasing capital intensity, knowledge intensity. And I think there are some challenges to many of the emerging uh, Asian markets in terms of how do they best participate uh, in what is a changing form of globalization. But it's no longer as reliant on far-flung supply chains with low wage and cost structures, but are more reliant on technology, knowledge intensity, and so on. And of course, we're now dealing with these issues in the context of a post-COVID world, or what will shortly be uh, a post-COVID world. And I think COVID, as in many other domains, has accelerated uh, pre-existing uh, trends. We've seen, uh, certainly in many parts of the world, uh, an acceleration of a transition to digital. People are working from home. They find new virtual ways of doing business. And I think similarly on the factory floor in businesses, there is going to be an acceleration of a process of um, uh, intensifying uh, uh, use of capital, of new technology, uh, and the like. Uh, and I think this places an additional set of challenges on uh, many Asian markets. How do you transition uh, to uh, this more knowledge, technology, innovation intensive mode of globalization? Uh, and so, although I don't think uh, there's going to be a fundamental reversal of globalization, it is certainly shifting uh, in nature. And that, that shift, if you like, poses a series of challenges uh, to Asian emerging markets. How, they, how can they continue to generate the kind of growth that they have uh, in this quite uh, in this quite different world. Uh, and so I think, you know, bearing in mind, this is not just an aggregate slowdown. Uh, the shape of, of globalization is really shifting. Uh, and Asian markets are going to need to, uh, to adjust, uh, to adapt. Uh, and we're already beginning to see some uh, Asian markets, you know, experiencing slowdowns uh, in growth. And although it is the case um, that many forecasters are picking 
uh, Asian emerging markets to recover from COVID very, very well. You can see these uh, IMF forecasts with many parts of Asia from uh, India, China, the ASEAN are expected to uh, recover very quickly uh, from COVID, which is clearly a very good thing. In a slightly more structural sense, there are some headwinds that are beginning to emerge that will, I think, demand uh, a policy response. And so I decided to talk through a little bit of what I think those uh, responses will look like. I, I don't think that um, you know, it's, uh, I'm not meaning to be at all faithless here. I think there are, uh, you know, so there is, I think, a reasonably positive outlook for the global economy, notwithstanding the risks. Uh, but to compete in that world, to prosper in that world uh, in a way that many Asian, Asian emerging markets have done uh, over the last few decades will require, I think, uh, a significant change uh, in policy. Um, uh, and I think the other dimension is, to, to, to bear in mind as we talk about policy is that the exposure, uh, if you like, of Asian markets uh, to these structural shifts, both from the nature of globalization, some of the dynamics that COVID is unleashing, uh, is going to vary quite significantly across the uh, Asian uh, economic uh, space. Now, already, of course, we see a very wide distribution of outcomes in terms of per capita income or productivity levels uh, across Asia, from economies like Singapore and Hong Kong and Taiwan, uh, through some of the lower income uh, ASEAN markets like Cambodia at the other end of the distribution. Uh, and I think as a first approximation, at least, the exposure that Asian markets have to these dynamics uh, is going to vary according to the current level of development. Uh, so one other way of saying that is I think that the distribution uh, of outcomes, the distribution, if you like, of the, the growth prospects for Asian markets will be somewhat path dependent. Uh, those markets that are already reasonably well advanced have capabilities around technology, uh, knowledge, innovation, um, sort of soft, uh, sort of intangible infrastructure like political and social institutions, uh, I expect are going to be better than those uh, that don't. Uh, and so if you like, there is probably going to be you know, a level of development above which countries will prosper uh, and a level of development below which it will be difficult to transition uh, from you know, a fairly low wage cost structure model to something that's more knowledge intensive. These are not new dynamics. Uh, there is much academic talk and policy talk around premature deindustrialization and middle income trap. Uh, I think COVID is going to intensify uh, some of those trends. So what does that mean in terms of the policy? There are really three things I think that, that at least stand out uh, to me. These are discussed in more detail in the underlying paper, but I'll just give you a flavor of where I think it's important for policymakers in Asia to, to be thinking. One, I think that there is no substitute for externally oriented growth models. Uh, so although it is the case that there are some headwinds uh, around the outlook for the global economy and for the shape of globalization, you know, I don't think that means that Asian economies should start to look inwards, at least not most of them. You know, yes, if you are China, you're a billion person plus, you've got a large domestic market uh, that can become you know, a more dominant uh, part of your economy. We've seen the export share in China reduce steadily. But for most Asian markets who have been externally oriented for decades, you know, I think that remains uh, the first order of business, the priority, uh, if you like. Uh, for small open economies, which constitutes uh, much of the Asian emerging market space, you know, uh, the external sectors are the productivity growth engines uh, of your economy. And so what does that mean? Well, it's going to be clearly a process of upgrading, uh, a need to uh, increase your footprint in more knowledge and innovation intensive uh, sectors that with greater investments in technology, uh, innovation, capital, uh, and so on. So thinking through, you know, where are the growth pockets in the global economy, of which there are many, they may not be exactly where you have a, an existing position of strength. Uh, there may be more services, for example, that are internationally traded, but really thinking through, you know, how do we as an economy position ourselves for this new world? How do we upgrade ourselves so we maintain a position of competitive advantage? That inevitably, I think, will mean much more investment in skills, uh, in innovation, uh, in appropriate infrastructure, uh, and the like, so you build the capabilities. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, maintaining a laser-like focus on the external or externally oriented parts of your economy remains, um, remains critical. The second, and Alicia also mentioned this, is that the global economy is becoming much more regional in nature, and that is true for Asia as well. Uh, the Asian consumer is a much more significant part of the global economy, and I think increasingly as we see frictions between different regional blocks, between the US, uh, Asia, Europe, there is going to be uh, an increasing focus on serving regional consumers, and so I think we will see a process of reconfiguration, if you like, of supply chains within Asian markets to focus much more on Asian consumers. So rather than simply being a cog in a supply chain where the end consumer is in Europe or the US, uh, I think there's going to be a much more regional uh, concentration. Now that's going to require, again, uh, some changes because the goods and services that are demanded in Asian markets 
their consumer preferences may be different than your traditional consumers. Uh, and so really trying to understand how do you position yourself in regional markets? How do you take advantage of new bits of regional trade infrastructure, be that TPP, uh, be that RCEP, be that ASEAN? You know, how do you really position yourself as an Asian emerging market uh, as selling into uh, other Asian markets as opposed to more far flung? So again, this notion that global supply chains are shortening in nature, it's not a reversal of cross-border interaction, but the, the geographic footprint uh, is shifting in Asian markets, I think, need to respond uh, to that. Um, yeah, that's not quite decoupling, although I suspect there is going to be a bit of decoupling, but decoupling is hard. Uh, so I think it's more a matter of degree, and it's more a matter of, of, of emphasis. Uh, and the last dimension, of course, is upgrading productivity in the domestic economy. You know, although it is the external sectors that will drive productivity growth, there is a, a need to make sure that domestic Asian markets are flexible, they are efficient, they're allocating resources appropriately, the role of the state is appropriate, uh, and so that you are putting yourself in as good a position as possible uh, to make sure that you can build that competitive uh, advantage. Uh, and there is, as the chart previously suggested, there is very significant variation across Asian markets in terms of how well uh, they are doing that. So in a sense, none of this is particularly new. Uh, you know, this chart, the version of this chart, you know, would have been probably appropriate a year, two years, uh, five years ago. Uh, I think that the issue is really one of intensity and urgency, uh, which COVID has really uh, brought to fore. Some of these headwinds are becoming much, much more acute uh, in Asian markets that they want to sustain the kind of economic and social outcomes that they have generated over the last uh, several decades. We'll need to make sure they continue to adapt uh, to what is, I think, going to be a structurally different world. Uh, and I would draw a, a distinction between what we are seeing now in responding to COVID and the, the medium term dynamics that COVID is unleashing versus the GFC a decade ago. The GFC, I think, was fundamentally a demand side shock. It didn't really derail globalization. I mean, yes, uh, the intensity of those cross-border flows may have flattened off, but it really was more of a demand side shock. Whereas I think one of the dimensions of COVID uh, and uh, the aftershocks from COVID is it's gonna have much more of a supply side or structural feel to it uh, around use of technology, uh, different growth rates across different sectors. And I think the, the priority for policymakers is to diagnose their exposure to some of those structural uh, supply side dynamics in the regional and global economy uh, and position themselves accordingly. And that's a much more, I would say, complex undertaking uh, than responding to the GFC, challenging uh, though that was. But the second thing I'd, I'd like to talk about is to use Singapore and Hong Kong as, if you like, uh, an example of where some of these dynamics have been playing out uh, and I think will continue uh, to play out. Singapore and Hong Kong clearly are somewhat uh, idiosyncratic uh, examples. They're both city-states. Um, but I think, uh, again, the similarities and differences between them give a sense of some of the broader dynamics uh, that I've been talking about. You know, Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, in a sense, have got very similar uh, growth models. Uh, both have been very uh, integrated, if you like, into the regional and global economy. Both have positioned themselves as hubs uh, for MNCs, for financial and business services. Both have very, very well-developed trade and logistics sectors and the like. So there's a lot, if you like, at, the, at superficial level to say, look, these economies are running uh, similar, uh, similar growth models. And indeed, if you look at the GDP growth trajectory uh, over the last two, three decades, you see a remarkably similar um, growth profile reflecting their high sensitivity uh, to, to, to global flows. But if you look below the surface, it actually turns out there are some increasingly obvious uh, differences between the growth models that are run uh, in Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, that I do think will affect their exposure to some of the dynamics that I have been uh, talking about. One way of capturing this, and there are others, but one thing, one way that I find uh, quite striking, if you like, uh, is the share of manufacturing to GDP uh, in Hong Kong uh, and Singapore. Hong Kong is the blue line on this chart. It has gone down from the, the mid-1980s at about 20%, very, very similar to, to Singapore, uh, to around 1% or so, um, and probably continuing to decrease. Whereas Singapore, albeit with a degree of bumpiness, you know, has roughly gone sideways. It's held at about 20% of GDP manufacturing share. And that has been more or less an explicit object of policy. They want to maintain a diversified economic base. They don't want to become like the city of London or to accept like Hong Kong, that's very, very concentrated on services. Their view was, look, let's maintain a more diversified base in terms of the MNCs that we bring in. Many of them have manufacturing activities. Yeah, clearly that's not the basic manufacturing that Singapore and Hong Kong did 20, 30 years ago, it's very uh, advanced, you know, around pharmaceuticals, around semiconductors and the like. But the fact is that Singapore had deliberately maintained a reasonably diversified uh, base with the associated domestic capabilities around that, uh, be it human capital and skills, 
uh, be it research innovation ecosystem, be it the clusters uh, of firms. Uh, and so if you like, Singapore has, as is the Singapore way, I suppose, been much more hands-on and deliberate uh, in terms of responding to globalization, pushing back against some of the forces of agglomeration. Whereas Hong Kong has taken, if you like, more of a laissez-faire approach saying, look, you know, we are going to double down on our comparative advantage and services. We are going to take advantage of uh, you know, regional and global integration. We're going to take advantage of our proximity to mainland China, uh, for example. Uh, and so, if you like, there has been an exit of certain types of activity um, from Hong Kong uh, into adjacent areas. Uh, manufacturing uh, is one. Uh, and a concentration of professional financial services uh, and the like uh, in Hong Kong. So I think you know, one of the, the consequences of that is Hong Kong has a much more leveraged model uh, to cross-border flows, uh, whereas Singapore has a degree of diversification and it has invested much more uh, deliberately, if you like, in, in terms of domestic capabilities. That's, of course, not to say that Hong Kong doesn't also have strong capabilities, but they are more concentrated, uh, if you like. But I think one of the, the, uh, the messages I take out of this kind of compare and contrast between Singapore and Hong Kong is different choices that have been made around deliberately building those capabilities. You know, another uh, measure that although is imperfect, I think is an indication of that, uh, is investment in innovation. So R&D is a share of GDP is one measure uh, of that. Hong Kong is towards the bottom of this chart. Uh, Singapore is a kind of a more mid-ranking uh, country among other advanced economies at around 2% of GDP. Now, partly this reflects uh, economic structure. Uh, it's not a, a full measure of innovation capability, but there is something I think interesting about the Singapore model where it is deliberately investing in capabilities, deliberately trying to upgrade uh, its uh, its competitive position, moving in over time into more advanced sectors, that I think gives it a degree of resilience. And particularly in a context where there are some headwinds to, uh, to global integration, it is changing uh, more rapidly. The decision to invest in capabilities and skills innovation, I think is critically important. Now that will look different in every country. And again, you know, Hong Kong does this in different ways as well. Hong Kong's got very strong uh, human capital endowment very strong investments in that space, as well as some innovation capabilities as well. But I think one thing that will mark out uh, the success or otherwise of economies as they're grappling with these things is their willingness to invest deliberately and heavily between factors that give them a competitive advantage in global markets around skills, around innovation, and ensuring that they respond quite deliberately and creatively uh, to these supply side changes in the global economy. Uh, so again, going back to my earlier remarks, uh, you know, Globalization will be here to stay, but it is changing quite markedly in nature. Uh, and that will demand quite a deliberate policy response from countries if they want to continue to generate the kind of outcomes they have over the last period of time. Let me stop here in the interest of time uh, and I'll hand back, to, hand back to Donald. Thank you very much. Mm, thanks very much, uh, uh, David. That, that was a, really a lot to digest. I just want to pick up on your point about how the exposure of uh, emerging markets might vary quite significantly. As you said, the distribution of growth prospects might be quite path dependent. But it's, but it's even more complex than that, isn't it? I mean, it's the middle income countries, the likes of Malaysia, Thailand, uh, that might be more at risk uh, of premature deindustrialization. Whereas the lower income economies like Cambodia, Vietnam, even Philippines and India, they may actually benefit from you know, China's upgrading of value chains and 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 and, uh, and and this development of capable uh, te technological capabilities. Uh, so maybe we'll, we'll circle back to you, David, to address that. Yep. You know how might you know things like premature deindustrialization and the shortening of global value chains uh, affect middle income versus low income uh, emerging markets uh, uh, in, th in this part of the world. Finally, on to uh, Professor Albert Ch uh, Albert Park, and what how would China respond to all of this? what's its uh, dual circulation strategy all about and how might other emerging markets uh, deal with the way China adapts to this uh, post-COVID world. Over to you, Albert. Great, thank you, Darrell. It's a great pleasure to be able to address this very interesting and very challenging topic. Um, I'm gonna start by making a few comments about uh, global, the global economy and then really focus a lot on what's happening in China and at the end turn to the implications for emerging markets. So um, this is a figure of the global GDP contributions of different countries and regions. And uh, you, know, you can see there's three big blocks, China, Asia, U United States, and Europe. And one thing I wanted to emphasize is that uh, it'll be extremely costly 
to the world and all three of these segments if there's really major decoupling of the economy because there is so much complementarity uh, between now a very globally integrated system that there will be very powerful forces especially in the business communities in all of these countries that will um, continue to push for globalization and not just local globalization, but really integration across these blocks. Um, and so I think- Sorry, sorry, Albert, sorry Albert, I'm gonna ask you to uh, uh, pause and then just maybe reshare your screen. Uh, some the participants can't see it. Maybe reshare your screen, Albert. And maybe put it to, uh, right, okay. You see this? Yeah, I can see this. Slides are moving. Uh, can, you, can you try moving them? Uh, yeah, I'm moving them now. Okay, uh, maybe put it to screen display. Uh, first enable editing and then move it to screen display. Oh, okay, okay, now yeah, now they're moving, thank you. Oh yeah, maybe that'll work. Okay, how about now? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, sorry, thank you. Um, so there are these three blocks and um, there's, there's powerful complementarities. And I, so I think, I guess the reports of the demise of globalization may be a bit exaggerated in my view, although, you know, notwithstanding um, Alicia's evidence about various trends towards deglobalization. But um, if you look at the contribution to growth in GDP, it's a much different picture where China and Asia account for over 50% of global growth. And so I think very much what happens in Asia is going to really be important for, for the global economy. And I think this point is also not lost on uh, the North American and European economies. Now, if we look at uh, growth in China, you can see that there is a recent pattern of slowing growth. There are a lot of natural headwinds that China has been facing with aging of the population, with kind of less opportunities for easy technology transfer, um, and of course, in the most recent period, we see uh, the decline due to COVID and the expected jump back up to eight plus percent growth. Um, in the right hand figure, there's a decomposition which looks at the, um, uh, the components of the growth where you can see that, you know, net exports is not really the main driver and that capital formation has been important, but really is declining. In the very recent few years, you see the role, the share of final consumption and growth uh, increasing in, in, in size. And we know there's a lot of evidence that the returns to investment have started to wane and decline in China, which has really spurred the emphasis on, you know, turning much more to the domestic market uh, to support uh, growth going forward. Now, if you look at the trade response to the trade war, and this is pre-COVID, uh, comparing 2019, uh, which really reflects responses to the trade war, which started in 2018, there's some interesting patterns in China's trade. You see, of course, that uh, imports uh, from the US fell and exports to the US fell even more, as well as exports going through Hong Kong. Um, but what's interesting is that overall, China's exports actually didn't decline at all. And the decline in the exports to the US were virtually fully offset by increased exports to other parts of the world, in particular to Southeast Asia, ASEAN, but also to some extent, Europe and other countries. Um, and so this trade war has, I think, accelerated the regional economic integration, although um, I think that was already happening and the dynamism of uh, ASEAN has also led naturally to increased attention and focus from uh, China in terms of its trade orientation. So some of that probably would have happened even without uh, the trade war, but it's certainly been accelerated by it. If you look at foreign investment as well, this is from some research um, we did at IMS on uh, the Belt and Road in Southeast Asia. And you can see there, there was a quite a large increase in Chinese FDI and construction projects in ASEAN countries, increasing by 85% and 33% if you just compare the annual flows um, after BRI and uh, compared to before BRI. Of course, in the last year or so, there's been a decline with all of the disruption. But I think a lot of the BRI projects uh, remain kind of in the plans of both China and the uh, Southeast Asian countries. 
And so here too, an investment, there's also greater integration. Of course, China's Belt and Road Initiative still is uh, seeking to promote greater global integration with um, other parts of the world. Okay, I wanna say a few words about the so-called dual circulation economy, which has been emphasized in the recent five-year plan, as well as uh, the work you know, report that the premier uh, presented on last Friday at the NPC, the National People's Congress meetings. And um, I wanted to just talk about what this means for how to interpret this in terms of uh, China's growth strategy going forward. I think the two components of the dual circulation economy that have received the most attention are that it, it is a strategy of greater reliance on domestic demand, although this is not actually a new goal of the Chinese macroeconomic uh, uh, policy. Um, and the second is uh, the development of greater domestic capacity for key technologies. And that's very much directly in response to recent events that have really threatened the integration of Chinese high tech companies with suppliers um, in, in the US and elsewhere. Um, that said, you know, the dual circulation economy does not say that China is planning to withdraw from the world. And, and leaders are very careful to say, we will continue to engage in the global economy. It's more of a sense that we need to refocus energy on aspects that are a little bit more reliable. So don't put all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak. And there's a lot of open questions about what the specifics are in terms of implications for, for very specific types of reform areas of trying to pursue these two broad objectives. For instance, there's been discussion of reforms to try to improve domestic circulation. And th that is not that that does not only mean just having people spend more money, it also means removing barriers to entry and having an efficient supply of goods to the domestic economy. And that can lead to thinking about efficiency of allocation of labor, of capital. Um, and, um, and if that's the way China kind of moves, I think that's, that would be very valuable, uh, both for uh, improving the, the domestic economy, but also for China's growth prospects. Because I think there's accumulating evidence that there are some still big problems in kind of how resources are allocated in the Chinese economy, which I think have not been fully appreciated. So the second point here is about the improving the innovation system, which really was a major focus of the 15th five-year plan. Um, and I think that I think is not a goal anybody could argue with. Of course, it still matters how you do that. And there still tends to be an approach in China to kind of throw money at the problem target certain sectors and then subsidize. And actually, I think if you look at how innovation works globally, those approaches are not the best approaches in the sense of having a strong track record of success. So I think, I think it still will do some good, but it's kind of a very crude type of approach perhaps, and maybe neglects some deeper reforms that are needed to really unleash innovation. The third specific here is about supply chain diversification. So I think China perceives that it needs to reduce reliance on the US, at least in high tech, maybe some other sectors. But does that mean they're going to be just developing these capacities domestically, or it means that they're just going to move the supply chains away from the US and to other countries? And that I think does have some implications for the opportunities of other emerging market countries. And finally, one aspect of uh, unleashing domestic demand could be related to the redistribution of income and wealth to put more money into the hands of the middle class, which would support a broader kind of a, a, a depth of uh, a demand increases. Um, there hasn't really been that much specific discussion of this other than the initiative uh, by the Chinese government to expand the enforcement and collection of personal income taxes, which actually would be, I think, uh, progressive if they were able to increase uh, revenues coming from that source. But that's not clear how that 
how, how fast that will occur. Now, um, there was a very interesting World Bank report on new drivers of growth in China. And I wanted to uh, put up this figure about uh, total factor productivity growth. So uh, productivity growth, of course, is really a key aspect of economic growth. And one thing you can see from the figure on the left is that there's been a market slowdown in productivity in China over the past decade. It dates even to um, before the financial crisis, if you go back way earlier. But certainly since then, uh, productivity growth has slowed to really you know, less than 2% in the last five or six years. And um, I think that should raise a lot of flags. Now, there's been productivity declines in other countries around the world, but I think it, it's the first period of extended slowdown in China, and there's been a lot of discussion. I mean, in the workshop uh, leading up to this report, there was a lot of discussion about what's causing this and why, why could, hasn't China been able to maintain the productivity growth of the past. And there was an interesting second figure, which is on the right here, which tries to break down productivity growth in the industrial sector using firm level data and decompose the overall productivity growth into components which include the within firm growth and productivity. So firms that existed throughout the period, do they increase their productivity? But then also, has there been uh, growth in overall productivity due to the entry of more productive firms or the exit of less productive form, firms, or at least the reallocation between or from the less productive firms to the more productive firms. And if you do that, the one um, bar I want to focus on is entry. So um, if you look at 1998 to 2007, entry ex explains the majority of overall productivity growth in the industrial sector. But in the second period from 2007 to 2013, it really shrinks to kind of 25% of the previous amount, accounting for much of the slowdown in productivity growth um, in the firm level data. And so it suggests that there is something going on in the open competition and free entry of firms in, in the industrial sector in China. And it, I think, reflects um, a lack of, well, let me put it this way, I think, um, the Xi Jinping government has continued to emphasize the leading role of state enterprises and the state in uh, growth and, and, and in key industrial sectors in China. I think there has been a lot of attention both by the national and local governments in identifying leading firms and supporting them. But of course, this introduces barriers or creates an unlevel playing field that considerably hampers the ability of maybe new and innovative, innovative firms to make progress and compete on a level playing field. And so this may be part of the problem. In the service sectors where China is now, you know, becoming the biggest part actually of the Chinese economy through structural change accompanying economic growth, there's a lot of uh, even higher barriers to entry than in the industrial sectors including in advanced kind of uh, financial services and professional services. And that also is an important uh, uh, barrier or a, a slow, slower of growth. And so there are all of these kind of uh, regulatory issues, which I think um, need to become much more the focus of reform if China is to improve its domestic circulation and raise its overall productivity. So I wanted to... Um, Put some of this in the context of what we just learned last Friday when Premier Li Keqiang gave his work report on you know, the economic um, priorities for the coming year. And um, of course, China introduced a growth target of over 6%, but there are no specific targets for the 14th five-year plan, reflecting, I think, uh, a consensus among Chinese leaders that there should be less of a focus on the kind of rate of economic growth and more of a focus on the healthy health of that growth, the sustainability of that growth, and maybe perhaps other objectives like climate change and things which might mitigate against achieving maximum rates of economic growth. A couple of the, um, a couple of the initiatives that have been highlighted from the work report include an effort 
to make loans more inclusive, to increase loans to micro and small businesses by more than 30% in 2021. And also, and this got, I think, more, much more attention to upgrade manufacturing capabilities. And again, to target eight priority areas of technology, which are all high-tech areas for support. Now, if you think about some of the issues I just mentioned about um, kind of constraints to productivity growth in China, I think this effort to make loans more inclusive is, if it's really implemented, is a step in the right direction, of course, that it will level the playing field where small firms have had great difficulty obtaining finance on the same terms as uh, larger firms in China, which is just one aspect of the difficulty in competing. The second area on upgrading manufacturing abilities, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it revisits all of the old debates about industrial policy. On the one hand, these do seem like important areas for China's future productivity growth. On the other hand, if it's approached in a very ham-handed way, where you're just throwing money and identifying uh, model firms or priority firms, it's not clear actually that it will, how much it will increase innovation as opposed to inhibit competition and more um, kind of grassroots innovation. So I think how they implement these plans, I think is really important. And the World Bank report on Innovate Asia really tried to, it, it was the release of that report was delayed for many, for actually a couple of years because the Chinese and World Bank sides couldn't agree to the, to the nature of the advice about state market relations and what the state's role is in, in a context when they know state-owned enterprises and industrial policies will continue. And they really tried to thread the needle and really try to advise China to make these types of uh, policies much more market-friendly as opposed to substitutes for the market. And there are a lot of details, I think, that are worth attention. Okay, so last uh, slide is here. What does that mean for emerging market strategies? I think um, there's enough growth momentum in China, regardless of kind of what they do. And there's a sufficient competence, I think, in, in how things are managed that China will continue to be a growth leader in Asia and the world. So every country in the world needs to have an engage, a strategy on how to engage China and to try to exploit opportunities of engaging China. Now, I actually think that China and countries in ASEAN, and even to some extent the United States, really can benefit from a recommitment to multilateral free trade under the World Trade Organization. If they can come to agreements on dealing with intellectual property rights, which actually is in China's own interest now at its stage of development, um, the US certainly will be looking for consensus with its allies on how to treat, part, to, to treat China. But I think they will also have a strong incentive to, to reach win-win solutions in a more multilateral framework. So I think China needs to keep this at very much high on its priorities, as well as other countries. Now, comparative advantage and global value chains is going to be the key for all countries in the world. Global value chains, even though they're declining, are still really defining how countries identify their comparative advantage in the world. And it doesn't always have to be absolute advantage. It can still be relative advantage. Um, now, opportunities may be shaped by how both the US and China adjust their supply chains. And so I just want to point out, for instance, if China says it's going to just source all its semiconductor chips domestically, obviously that's going to hurt opportunities for Taiwan Semiconductor or Samsung. And so it will reduce opportunities for some emerging markets. But if they think, try to reshape supply chains by diversifying and still integrating them in other countries in Asia or globally, I think that will, could introduce more opportunities if it's moving away from US spheres to Asia spheres. I think the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement can play an important role because one of the, I'm not an expert on this law, but a lot of people have emphasized that one thing it really does well is reduce a lot of the um, regulatory barriers to integrating supply chains within among these countries. So it should become actually much easier for China to diversify its supply chain structure to other countries in Asia as part of its overall global strategy. And so that could work, a, work against an agenda of purely domestic um, self-sufficiency. So let me stop there and give it back to Donald. Thank you.
Mm, thanks so much, Albert, for that very comprehensive look at what's happening in China. Uh, okay, so it's, it's Q&A time. Uh, we've got a handful of questions, so I'll try to group them. Maybe we'll start with Alicia. There was a question around what, what do you think is explaining the reduction in people-to-people -people flows across country? Uh, I guess a lot of it has to do with the fact that you know, what China did for people and pe people to people flows cannot be replicated. So, you know, obviously that is slow. Also, there was a question on what explains Europe's lower participation in global value chain. Is it, is it compensated for, for instance, by the fact that there's been greater intra-European uh, trade flows? So in other words, was it driven by a search of, for more sustainable uh, regional uh, uh, value chains? Uh, maybe Alicia, you'd like to take those? Yes. Well, I mean, I wish I knew what, what has been slowing down people to people movements. I, I think, you know, a lot might, ha, might come from the mere fact that we, the growth rate of people to people movement was humongous uh, for a long time. And maybe, you know, there was a plateau in that increase and perhaps populism, nationalism, all of those trends may explain um so think about trump's policies on uh, on uh, immigration for example yeah that that could be behind those that stagnation that i showed on europe we actually wrote a piece for bruegel um uh, showing that uh, something that that many europeans probably don't realize i didn't realize before i i, I looked into the data that intra-European trade is actually shrinking, especially value chain one with input output data. Uh, so you may say, um, you know, what's happening? So that reduction that we show in that graph in the participation of, of Europe in the global value chain is mainly explained by a very sharp reduction of exports of intermediate goods for other countries to re-export and instead though, um, quite an increase of imports, although of course smaller, uh, of intermediate goods for re export from Europe. So net net is, is, is of course negative. Now what's happening is China. China is substituting these major exporters, Germany being the, the obvious example, in, in that um, export of intermediate goods. And that is what is shrinking. So it's not not really, you know, it's, it's how would I say? It's, it's more about China's overwhelming role than than really um, anything else. Uh, in that piece, we explain why maybe this is happening. One is the reason that the, um, you know, that was actually reflected in the question, which is a good point, is that. Europe is shrinking in size versus the rest of the world and especially China. So of course its participation in the value chain is shrinking as well, but it's shrinking beyond what should be the case given its shrinking size, if you see what I mean. And that reason is related to China. And this is because what we're showing in that thing is that uh, Europe is losing in terms, I mean, losing ground in terms of uh, expenditure in R&D or even you know, in relative terms, basically China is converging. It's not, it's, it's about the same percentage of GDP today. Um, so that's the reason. China is becoming more competitive and, and Europe is shrinking and that's also its export market in intermediate goods is also shrinking. So that's all from my side, thank you. Thanks so much, Alicia. Let me throw it to David and Albert. Um, I mean, David, you seem, my question earlier, you seem to suggest that the growth prospects for the more relatively more advanced emerging markets, the Singapore, Hong Kong, and, uh, careers of the world might would would be more optimistic, uh, given that they have you know, superior tech capabilities and more mature institutions, they can pivot more easily in this post-COVID world. Uh, whereas Albert, you seem to suggest that as China upgrades and tries to increase domestic demand and reduce its reliance on uh, you know low-tech uh, industries, that might benefit uh, you know countries behind it, right? The likes of Vietnam and Cambodia. So. Maybe you guys can sort it out. <laughs> what's what's the what's the prognosis here for both uh, more mature emerging markets as well as you know the those really that's they're just beginning on their development journey, the Cambodia, Vietnam's, and Bangladeshis of the world. Yeah. Well, sure, I'll, I'll take a start on, and then I'll, perhaps you can um, uh, sort of weigh in. So, I mean, I think there's certainly not a kind of a one-for-one -one relationship 
between you know, current level of productivity or per capita income uh, and, and growth outlooks, although there is a tendency in that direction. So I think you know, the more advanced countries uh, in Asia's, the Hong Kong, Singapore's, Taiwan's, South Korea's, Japan's, and so on, you know, I think they do have the capabilities and the ability to respond to move into increasing knowledge and capital uh, intensive uh, activity. So I don't worry so much about them, nor frankly do I worry too much about China. I mean, in terms of Albert's remarks about innovation and productivity, I mean, yes, not all is uh, you know, plain sailing and there are some risks as there always are around China, but I think China has also demonstrated an ability to kind of respond and to upgrade its economy. Where, where I think there are some more issues, uh, as your question indicates, is in the kind of middle and lower income uh, end of the spectrum. Uh, in terms of middle income countries, a kind of a so-called middle income trap around which there's been some recent um, uh, academic work saying, well, perhaps it doesn't really exist and convergence happens anyway. But I do think if you look at the Malaysias, the Thailands, uh, and like, they really have struggled to kick on uh, in terms of you know, keeping going with the growth rates, developing new areas of competitive advantage. And I think that's a combination of you know, how do you manage to develop new areas of advantage with a wage and cost structure that's already you know, at high, so you can't compete on wages and costs alone. And they have struggled to do that. I think the quality of the policy making uh, apparatus, the, the, pol the political and social institutions are a, a drag in that regard. And so I think given the intensity of competitive pressure uh, and of global headwinds in a post-COVID world are going to become uh, more, not less intense, I think that's going to shine a spotlight, if you like, on the quality of uh, institutions in those countries. Uh, if they can respond, then fine. Uh, but I think there are some you know, worrying indications that perhaps that's going to be much more difficult to do than perhaps we would uh, like. And that's true, I think, also for um, you know, sort of the Indonesias uh, and Philippines of the world as well. They've got some real structural challenges in terms of uh, building new strengths, uh, but they've got to do that. That relies on the quality of policy making, and I think there are some, some, some issues there. So I think the middle income trap is going to become uh, more, not less acute. Uh, but then I think, as you say, if you look at the lower income countries, I think it really is going to be a, a nuanced picture. Uh, if you look at countries like Vietnam, very successful in attracting uh, FDI, you know, either as a kind of a China substitute or in some cases a diversification uh, out of China, uh, including in some quite advanced uh, categories. I think countries like Vietnam you know, are building capabilities, at least parts of their economy, that give me a measure of confidence in their outlook and their ability to kind of upgrade um, uh, and, and the like. Whereas other parts of uh, Asia, let's say the Cambodias, the Laos's of the like, you know, yes, there might be some spillover from China, uh, but given the ability for technology to substitute away from low cost labor, it's not gonna be anything as pronounced as what we've seen over the last several decades. So this you know, uh, oft discussed phenomenon of premature deindustrialization, I think that's gonna become particularly acute in some of the lower income uh, ASEAN countries. So you know, unless you are able to really find a niche with some accompanying capability in parts of your economy, a la Vietnam, you know, I think those kind of lower income tranche of, 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 of Asian countries uh, are going to struggle. So, you know, I think it's going to be kind of a, a more mixed picture, if you like, both in the middle income group, where a lot, I think, rests on quality of political institutions in terms of driving change in the economy, and similarly at the lower income end of the spectrum in terms of your ability to kind of, you know, identify those you know, limited number of areas in which you can um, demand an edge. But I think you know, as a general uh, picture, you know, the more advanced you are at the moment, the more capabilities you have, the easier it will be to continue to upgrade uh, and transform your economy. It's not impossible at the bottom or the lower end, but I think it is a more kind of challenging set of, 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 um, uh, of issues. And I don't think that kind of demand spillover from China uh, is going to be sufficient to kind of uh, overwhelm, if you like, um, those challenges. Albert, anything the lower end developing countries can yeah, do? Yeah, I mean, I actually don't really disagree with many of the things David said, but I think I'm much more optimistic about the prospects of poor countries. I mean, for one, uh, it's kind of a well-known stylized fact that poor countries grow tend to grow faster than rich countries. And the reason is, is that they can really, they don't have to be innovative. They can just transfer technologies because they're so far from the global frontier. If they have basic, you know, institutions, et cetera. And, you know, there's been recent research, which has found that compared to earlier periods of growth, that there's now kind of an absolute uh, convergence of of income of, of GDP growth across the world. You know, we had Michael Kramer talking about this a couple weeks ago where, you know, it's very clear in the data that in the, especially the last decade that poorer countries are growing faster than richer countries like economic theory would predict. And they argue that it's because basically the quality of institutions has become much more similar across countries. Whereas before there was a lot of extreme dysfunction due to conflict or just, you know, really backwards institutions. And if you look at Asia, for instance, 
you know, of course, the capabilities of a country like Cambodia are very limited, but they do have governments which now are kind of developmental states, at least to the extent that they really are putting a high priority on economic growth. They're getting quite a lot of investment in from China to build up infrastructure. They're trying to improve their, you know, starting from, you know, <laughs> a low base, the, the ease of doing business. They're improving on a lot of these measures. And even in Southeast Asia, the growth rates of the poorer countries has been faster than the growth rates of the rich countries. That's not to say Dave is wrong in everything he says, because it's also the case that if you look at where foreign investment going, it's not going to the poor countries. It's much more going to the richer countries in ASEAN. And it's attracted by the better institutions and capabilities. But at the same time, there are these kind of very primitive factors which still create pretty strong potential for growth momentum. And the other thing as an economist, you know, trade economists always emphasize that it's, it's more important to think about relative comparative advantage than absolute comparative advantage. So there will still always be an opportunity for finding your niche in global value chains, um, even if uh, productivity is low, because it'll attract wages. And so, you know, so I, that, I'm not really disagreeing with the kind of many of the arguments, but I think there are also these other forces um, and that there's really no other game to play. So the poor countries have to just do their best and uh, improve their institutions, improve their business, the, the quality of their human capital if they can, create stability, you know, all of the things that um, businesses need and they can be successful. Even, you know, Vietnam is a good example of, of course of that. They're a very poor country still, but now attracting a ton of FDI because they they've established some of those things. And, but I think, you know, there's some evidence that, um, you know, there's a fair amount of Chinese investment now going to places like Cambodia and Laos, chasing the low wages, not as much as Vietnam. Um, so it's always a difficult game, but I, I think there's still potential. If I can just stay with you for a while, uh, Albert, and also bring in Alicia. Uh, you, Albert, you made a very interesting point about how China is at the stage now where it's trying to introduce these uh, more market oriented reforms, right? Uh, trying to level the playing field, trying to reduce, potentially reduce the role of SOEs. Uh, uh, how much of that do you think um, will actually happen, right? Uh, I mean, it, it's, its tendency is to do it using top-down, heavy-handed, as you put it, old-school industrial policies. Uh, there's a, you know... At, at I, not, I, Donald, I didn't really mean to suggest they were doing that aggressively. I, I, I was kind of saying that's what they should do and need to do. But I'm not that optimistic that they're that they will, very yeah. aggressive. Yeah. Alicia, you want to add on to the point about what, what, what you see in, in China in terms of moving towards a more market-oriented, uh, market-reliant way of allocating resources, and whether that will promote domestic competition, a more efficient allocation of resources? Well, I've not seen much of that in the five-year plan, I have to say. I think uh, probably there is a change in perception of Mark, what market forces may bring to China. I think there is a, and in a way rightly so, because there's been many um, disappointments with market forces elsewhere. Yeah, you think about the global financial crisis, uh, you may think that, you know, the response to COVID maybe with a less centralized uh, model would have been worse. You know, there's many, many ways in which you can justify their, that they're not really thinking, uh, in my opinion, um, um, in that direction. That doesn't mean that, of course, um, market forces are to be ruled out. They are opening up the economy. You know, we have the new foreign investment law, et cetera but always under the control, I mean, under the supervision, perhaps I shouldn't say control, of a centralized and planned economy. I think that's where we are. Uh, history is not very generous on this model, but you know, history is not all. Uh, the future sometimes may not necessarily be that, that of recent history. So I think that's the trend and, and I don't think I'm, I'm saying anything new because that's the definition of this next phase yeah i mean the from the great great rejuvenation we're now in this new phase which is very obviously um more geared towards a socialist um economic mm. model uh, and that to me doesn't ring as a, a bigger um, role for the market but that that is not of course the old socialist model that we all yeah. learned in history books. It's a very different model. So I think it's a combination of the two under a very clear 
supervision of um, of the central and local governments and with this uh, planning ahead all the way to 2035 by the way longer and longer planning that's that would be my take i mean one one positive note is you know in partly in response to the trade war china did implement a much improved foreign investment foreign direct investment law which created a negative list which really increased should increase access of foreign firms uh, to invest in china so that's one positive example there was a question also uh, on you know how are we to uh, respond to RCEP. Do we see this as uh, the decoupling of East Asia from the rest of the world? Um, and also, maybe I can broaden up the question. Uh, you know, I mean, David, you spoke about the changing shape of globalization, uh, even if it is not deglobalization. Uh, what happens to the very globally oriented hubs, uh, by which, of course, in this part of the world, would be Sing uh, Hong Kong and Singapore? Uh, how should they? You know, assuming that globalization now takes on a more regional posture, right? A more regional orientation. How should these hubs uh, respond? I mean, I, I, obviously, this question is most salient, most pressing in places like Hong Kong and Singapore. Well, I'd say they already are becoming quite regional uh, in nature. I mean, for Hong Kong, obviously, it's mainland China is a big draw. So you look at export share, you look at FDI flows, you know, um, trade movements, FDI, uh, sorry, movements into China, mainland China are the, the key things. Sing similarly, Singapore has got a much more uh, deliberate policy focus on regional integration, hasn't always been the case, but ASEAN has become a much more uh, sort of high priority uh, area. You know, policy makes are encouraging firms to invest enterprise policy is much more focused uh, on ASEAN than, than used to be the case. So I think there's a recognition that although, you know, global MNCs, global firms will still regard Hong Kong, Singapore, Dubai, others as kind of as important notes, uh, there is a sense in which you need to uh, diversify, uh, you need to de-risk, and a key part of that, I think, is uh, looking closer to home. And economic gravity applies to these global hubs as well as it does uh, elsewhere. Uh, tacit knowledge flows uh, matter. So I think we will see Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, some of Dubai, and, and others become you know, much more uh, regional uh, in, in, in nature. I mean, yes, there'll still be the global flows, as I said, but they'll become increasingly regional hubs with, with tighter links into their immediate, um, their immediate region. And I think there are going to be you know, winners and losers, um, you know, kind of from that. Um, there's going to be a degree of competition uh, as well. But I think, you know, that's going to be reinforced by some of this uh, trade architecture that we see, uh, be it TPP at one level, but certainly ASEP, uh, ASEAN uh, itself. I think that's going to increasingly shape and support, you know, where firms uh, and where countries see, uh, where see their future. And I think there is, you know, the, the geopolitical um, sort of aspect to international commerce has become more lot less pronounced. I think, ironically, probably more so under President Biden than under President Trump. I mean, there's not going to be the noise and the psychodrama about the trade wars and the, the tweets uh, and the like, but I mean, the US has shifted uh, in terms of where the bipartisan consensus is. And I think President Biden, with a much more disciplined, coordinated, structured approach, there is going to be a much more of a, a pulling away, not a, not a full decoupling, because that is difficult to do. But I think you know, one response to that is going to be a much more regional focus to the activities of firms. Uh, and of hubs like a, like a Singapore in uh, Hong Kong. And I think that's going to uh, intensify. It's not going to decimate the global economy. Global flows will continue, but it's going to have a much, much more regional focus to it. Mm. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just read out one last question. Uh, should we expect to see more of a, more of a Asian economic community? Uh, would Asia become more economically integrated, especially if Europe, uh, you know, I wouldn't say disengages, but you know, uh, becomes a lesser part of uh, global value chains. Any, any, I mean, RCEP is principally focused on East Asia and Australia and New Zealand, but there's also South Asia, which uh, potentially could be brought into the fold. Um, I mean, obviously this is not <laughs> the expertise of economists. Uh, this goes into the realm of uh, 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 Joe economics, but if I could, you know, get views from Albert and, and, and Alicia as well on this. Albert, you want to take a crack at this? Yeah, I mean, I think there are strong tends to stronger Asian economic integration. I mean, to be honest, ASEAN, you know, has been around for a long time. And for many years, I think people kind of complained that it wasn't really doing a lot of concrete things. <laughs> and there, and you saw a lot of um, kind of very slow slowness in, in increasing the, the real integration of the economies because, you know, earlier they were often kind of competing against each other for similar export markets. and. Uh, but I think it's changing now as the there's a more diversity of development stages. So there's a national co Nash 
natural complementarity. There's also the integration with China. I think the U.S. is going to really regret, you know, disengaging from the trade agreements and from the, the TPP and now the RCEP and the um, if uh, if it really leads to a much uh, stronger regional uh, economic integration, because that's where all the growth is, um, and uh, I think that's that's a huge cost to uh, U.S. producers and firms if they're mm -hmm. not as integrated. So I think that's that is the trend of the future. Right, Alicia, do you see the rise of an Asian bloc? Um, it, frankly, it's been a while since I thought I. I was starting to see one. This was, I still remember, even before moving to Hong Kong, I was in Tokyo, trying to write about the future of uh, monetary integration, for God's sake. I mean, nothing of that has ever happened. I'm telling you, like 2004 or something. And, and I don't think Asia is homogeneous enough to see a major degree of integration. By that, I mean European type model. Right. I don't think. I mean, trading is just natural because they're all growing, and you know it. it and, and and by the way, and the very large uh, differences in endowments and income per capita actually foster that, you know, by principle of comparative advantage. So, but that's easy. The the point is really going beyond. So, uh, I think the the comment um, we receive is, you know is Europe less and less integrated? I mean, maybe trade-wise, but if you think about the measures that have been taken out of COVID in terms of, you know, the rescue plan and so on, I mean, nothing of that sort could ever, ever happen in Asia. Mm -hmm. So it's a different type of integration, if I may say so. I mean, right. Europe is, is at a very advanced level, rightly or wrongly, I'm not judging that advanced means good. It's just that it is more advanced in terms of, you know, in, yeah. in many er economic areas, um, let alone obviously monetary and exchange rate policy, but beyond fiscal is starting. I don't think Asia will ever do that. Right. It's just very different countries. Okay, I think that's a good note. I think there's been a mix of optimism uh, uh, of, about the prospects of emerging markets in this part of the world. Nothing to uh, be too despondent about uh, uh, in this, uh, still the fastest growing region uh, on, on this plan. And as we come out of COVID, uh, plenty still of room for uh, global exchange or at least regional flows of trade, of uh, capital, of people. So on that note, uh, thank you everyone for attending. If I can ask the uh, speakers to just stay on for a couple of minutes. Uh, but thanks everyone for attending and for staying, us, staying with us till the end. Uh, goodbye and I'll see you at the next uh, IEMS uh, event. All the best everyone.